So those right there, uh, those are Israeli extremists um, in Jerusalem um, celebrating what they call the March of the Flags, which is a holiday that was invented by Israel to celebrate essentially the occupation of Jerusalem in 1967. As a part of their their celebration, they were chanting pretty awful things about Palestinians, about Muslims. Um, and I wanted to um, give you more context and then show you some of those videos. <laughs> um, so crowds were mostly made up of young Orthodox Jewish men and they began gathering at the Damascus Gate around 3 p.m. chanting and dancing. As the afternoon wore on and their numbers grew, local Palestinians began retreating from public spaces and closing their businesses. Um, but of course, that wasn't enough. And they took this march, this Flag Day march, took it to the, specifically the Muslim quarters and began attacking people. So one ultra Orthodox man spat at and attacked an elderly Muslim woman and crowds jeered as the Palestinian Red Crescent tried to evacuate an injured Palestinian through the mass of people. So we have actually footage of not the spitting, um, but a couple of uses of tear gas or excuse me, pepper spray uh, on Palestinians, uh, Muslim residents and, sh and shopkeepers who were there and trying to sort of resist themselves, but nonviolently. Take a look at this. So those are uh, Israeli um, citizens using pepper spray against uh, injured people, against uh, unarmed. You saw uh, an elderly woman there. Um, and this is something that happens every single year. But by a lot of accounts from journalists, this year was a lot more militant on the Israeli side um, and a lot scarier and a lot bigger actually. Um, Rescue Service said that 62 people were injured by Israeli police. Um, including 23 who needed hospitalization. So again, this is not, it's not just these, the settlers or the extremists. The IDF, the police are also involved. So Israeli police said that they arrested more than 60 people suspected of disorderly conduct or assaulting police officers and that five officers had been injured. They might, those, those arrests might have been, again, citizens of Israel as well as um, Palestinians, Palestinian citizens of Israel and Palestinian citizens of the West Bank. Um, but I wanna play and I think we have it. Do we have the sot uh, with Shireen about um, Shireen the journalist who was recently, recently killed, Abu Akleh? Let's just go to this because to give you a sense of the kind of vitriol that's being spouted um, at these so-called celebrations. Um, not only was there chance of death to Arabs, um, not only was there pepper spray, but uh, Shirin Abu Akleh, who was recently murdered by the Israeli military. Um, again, journalist, longtime journalist for Al Jazeera. I think we all know that story. This is how um, the Israelis that day are celebrating her death, essentially. Take a look. like a very, very racist football match. Uh, it is uh, that they, if you're listening as a podcast, they were chanting um, Shireen is a whore, um, Muhammad the prophet is dead uh, and death to Arabs. Um, I wanted to just kick it over to you Waz. I think it's you know sometimes important that we cover these stories <laughs> when there isn't like intense violence or um, Rockets being fired. This is the kind of like low level type of aggression, if you can even call it low level, that happens specifically in Jerusalem and East Jerusalem every day. Yeah, and you know, man, I really think people should always be wary of pretty much any form 
of nationalism or tribalism because it's almost always a a project of the elites, right? And the the elites, the the powers that be in the Israeli government, they love to fan this sort of stuff. They love to stoke this kind of flame because this is where they generate a lot of their base of support. Um, it's rally around the flag type of stuff. It's you know anti-Palestinian, anti-Arab or Muslim, which is kind of funny considering how cozy they are to the actual Saudi government mm-hmm. um, in Saudi mm-hmm. Arabia, mm-hmm. Uh, in Saudi Arabia these days. But yeah, anytime you see this kind of stuff, just know that these fans are being flamed by the powers that be, by the power structure. Um, they always resort to this antagonistic posturing to be like, we're the only ones that can save you from those savage Arabs and Muslims. And this is the result of that to me anyway, because this is just um, kind of ridiculous <laughs> to be honest with you. It's not like these these uh, Palestinian citizens are some group of people that get to wield any kind of power whatsoever. I don't understand the point of even this show of force when you're talking about a group of people who are basically living in a part in an apartheid state and are extremely marginalized. So you know this is just you know people's fan in the flame, stoking the fires to keep that base of support and. Yeah, absolutely. And I know that recently Naftali Bennett, the current prime minister, is saying that some of these organizations um, that have led some of these the most violent um, protests that they're you know so-called terrorist organizations. You know, and they 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 sort of they finger wag on them. And it reminds me of you know here in the United States, a little bit of a like it's the uh, Proud Boys uh, stand back and stand by. It's like. We're trying to condemn them with one hand and then also like a sort of a wink and a nod with the other. But I think you're absolutely right that this has been fanned by extreme nationalism. And in this case, obviously, also again, apartheid and occupation. But nationalism, extremist nationalism looks the same wherever it may be. And the thing that remind that, that it sort of makes me think about is the way that Trump's base has gotten out of hand. He loves it, by the way, but he also is low key afraid of them, right? You know, they pretty much came for everyone except for him on January 6th. And it, it's similar in Israel, where it's like, this is a base that has been stoked by the right in that country, and they don't have any control over them. They have no control over what they do or don't do. And maybe that is kind of part of the plan. I just wanted to. You know, obviously, Jerusalem, holy city. There are uh, there are three important landmarks there. You've got Temple Mount, the Al Aqsa Mosque, the Dome of the Rock, right? And so, I wanted to just give you some context about why this time is a little bit different, because um, on Sunday, this is this recent Sunday, 2,600 Jewish pilgrims visited the Temple Mount, accompanied by Israeli police, which is a much higher number than usual. That 2,600, the visit prompted about 40 Palestinians who had barricaded themselves inside the mosque overnight to throw rocks and fireworks. Israel's police said in a statement that they locked the building's gates and made several arrests before the situation quieted around midday. Now, for some context, Jews are allowed to visit and pray at the Temple Mount. Um, Oh, excuse me, they're allowed to visit, but they're not allowed to pray at Temple Mount. There's like a sort of an informal agreement. But in recent years, growing numbers of Jewish visitors sometimes praying or with police escorts have inflamed longstanding Palestinian fears that Israel plans to annex the area. So it's essentially, you know, Israelis going into the holiest place for Muslims, for Palestinians. And for Palestinian, for Muslim Palestinians, excuse me, not all Palestinians are Muslim. Um, and kind of just like having their way with this historic site and this religious sacred site, um, as if you know the shoe on the other foot would never be allowed. But so, and a lot of you know Muslims are seeing that, and a lot of Palestinians are seeing this as like, yo, they're gonna try and annex East Jerusalem at any moment. Here, you, they are celebrating. Um, the annexation or the occupation of most of Jerusalem, um, which again has consistently been like a, a middle ground city, kind of like a like a base, like a hands off city. But Israel's completely ignored that, and the sixty seven war was part of the beginning of them really ignoring um, honoring Jerusalem for what it is. And so, 
it all is foreshadowing of I think what probably will be honestly an annexation of East Jerusalem. And you could see that if you guys remember the incursions into the the, the community of Sheikh Jarrah, the city of Sheikh Jarrah um, and the killing of, of civilians there. It, you know, days after Shireen Abu Akleh was killed, you saw Israeli settlers moving in with all of their things to an empty building. So it's just like, it's it's a it's a persistently changing terrain in the in in Israel Palestine, meaning that consistently Palestinians are given the short end, and Israelis continue to build settlements, continue to displace Palestinians, and then sort of flaunt it in these really really egregious ways. Um, anything else to add, Waz, before we move on? Man, uh, I gotta say, I was struck by the uh, calling the journalist a whore. I'm like, do whores not deserve to live? Jesus Christ, I don't understand <laughs> that. <laughs> what about John's? I mean, good <laughs> grief, not to make Bring light in. of this woman's death, but like, I don't see how being a whore means you deserve to die. That's a bit ridiculous, guys. Well, Give yeah, it the times. You know. Exactly, uh, we're pro-sex worker on TYT, but uh, sadly, uh, nationalist extremists <laughs> are not. generally tend to be pretty misogynistic. So uh, yeah, 